Hi, everyone. Um, I hope you're having a wonderful conference so far. I'm excited to talk to you today. So I just wanted to start by asking you to close your eyes and think about a child in your life that you really love. Now, I want you to open your eyes and imagine what would happen if that child didn't have access to play. Now, unfortunately, this past year, we all know how that feels. We know, all know how detrimental it was when playgrounds closed or school closed and our children didn't have access to, um, to playing with their peers, to going to the playground, to enjoying play. Now, I want you to imagine not being able to play was part of a child's everyday life. This is the reality for many refugee children around the world. Refugee children might stay in a camp for years on end, sometimes their entire childhood. I learned this firsthand when I was working with refugee children in uh, 2018. I had the honor to uh, run a game design workshop. This is my background um, in uh, Athens, where I'm from, in a refugee camp called Histon. And the first thing I noticed was the camps were packed with kids. There were just so many kids around and there was no space for them to play. As a designer, I went into uh, research mode. I started looking into playgrounds and, and ways to bring um, play to a refugee camp. And I quickly found out it was really, really expensive uh, and very hard to do. So there is this silent play emergency, right? So providing access to play spaces is not a luxury, it's a necessity. Uh, we know that play is incredibly important in not only a child's uh, emotional well-being, but also their learning and their development, especially in early ages. Playing prevents mental health issues for children, and it's not just for fun, right? It's the fuel of social, emotional, and cognitive skill building. Play enables caregivers as well to build nurturing relationships with their children. So while we were in Greece, <clears throat> we learned firsthand how transformational play can be for children affected by crisis. And as I said, the only solution on the market available to refugee camps was playgrounds, the same playgrounds me and you have in the cities we live. So what if instead of building playgrounds, which are really costly to maintain and build, we thought of play, play spaces the same way that we think about Legos. Enter Follies. Follies are uh, uh, big building blocks. You can just put them together just in a few minutes and create um, a modular system that fosters playful learning and can serve millions of refugee children at a time. Follies has recently been recognized as a toy of the year finalist as well, and it's available for everybody to purchase. So there are six key ingredients that make Follies really wonderful as a play solution. It's a system of large building shapes that enables four play patterns, uh, such as um, um, uh, running around, <laughs> like you can see, uh, construction and also imaginary play. It's gender neutral and cultural appropriate. It's an out of the box experience and it's made out from 100% on toxic high quality recyclable materials. But I wanted to talk about the last ingredient, which is the open source license, which supports in-country production. So you might be wondering, how does this fit with a refugee? So here I wanted to share um, a pilot we did with an amazing organization called Alicia in uh, Athens, Greece. Alicia has an award-winning vocational training program, and I'm just going to play the video. Um, hopefully you'll be able to see it. If not, just uh, if you could let me know, because I can't see my screen in the chat. <laughs> Thank you. 
So I'm going to actually stop sharing for a minute because I want to take a few questions and then we'll dive back into, um, oops, we'll dive back into the slides. So the way the program works is uh, refugee youth um, get trained in uh, Odysseus vocational um, training program. Then they learn how to manufacture their own folly sets, which are then distributed in refugee camps. So it's a truly holistic program that engages the community from all sides and um, uses the open source license that Follies have. So I thought we'll do a fun exercise, if that's okay with you. Um, I wanted to, um, here, I'll put again my slide up. Oops. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, what are three ways you could make your own space more playful? So take a few minutes and maybe add in the chat three ways you can look around in your space. Um, I have many things here that could make maybe my space more playful. I'm in my studio in DC. Um, and type them in the chat. I'll type also the question. Okay, while you're thinking about this question, we'll continue um, with uh, the, the rest of the presentation. Oh, there you go, Play-Doh. I was, I was worried, nobody had ideas. <laughs> Providing access to safe things to play. Signs encouraging touch and try. Oh, I love this. And of course, play. Adding more soft play items. Color, tactile materials, and interactive. Amazing. These are great, all these are great, um, great, great ideas. allowing freedom and creativity. Amazing. Okay, great. So let's continue. Let me just pull my screen again up. And I'm going to talk now about um, another playful project that we are doing in Kenya and in which we are also um, using microbit. So hopefully it will be exciting for those of you. Uh, I see there are a few people from uh, Nigeria here today and other countries. Um, okay, so let me do this again. Okay, and let me know if you cannot see my screen. So I wanted to talk about K-Play. It's uh, a, a project that we started this year in partnership with an incredible organization called IREX, as well as technical partners from the Exploratorium, MIT Media Lab, Lab and Tufts University, with generous support from the LEGO Foundation. Uh, so the program aims to serve up to 90,000 students in the uh, coastal areas of Kilifi and Kualim, uh, north of Mombasa in Kenya, uh, through playful learning, uh, programming, and teacher training. So there are three pillars. It's a really big four-year project, and uh, I just want to touch a little bit on, on some of the pillars today and then open it up for questions. So there are three pillars in this program. There's a teacher training component, a community engagement component, um, so engaging with the parents and the community as well as um, uh, the community leaders, and then um, the idea of uh, creating play labs in schools, so pop-up play spaces uh, within uh, schools in Kilifi and Kuala. And I would say if you take one thing from, from this presentation today and our approach to this program is that we have used co-design as a methodology. So instead of us going in and saying, okay, what, what, what we should we do? Um, we really involve the community in every aspect of designing this program. And I should mention um, our team, uh, Humans Who Play, is a technical partner in this project. And then IREX um, uh, is uh, the implementation partner and IREX Kenyan specific is leading all, all this work in Kenya. So co-design as a methodology, the way the way the program has worked is throughout the first year, um, we have uh, three training academies in which uh, we bring um, a women curriculum, a training curriculum to teachers, and uh, we test it out, we iterate on it, and we really get their input as we develop it. 
And there are three kind of core parts of this curriculum. First, it's really modular. So the activities can be used standalone, mixed and matched. Ideally, these activities are eventually remixed with uh, coaches and teachers. I should also mention that the activities match the national CB, uh, CBC framework from the Ministry of Education. They're also flexible. So we started this program the year of COVID and, you know, we imagined it would be in-person training. And of course, we had to do things through Zoom and WhatsApp. And so we developed a program that, you know, works in person for small groups, synchronously on Zoom, synchronous, synchronously on the phone, asynchronously offline and adapts in person in big groups. Um, so we're truly looking at, at programming and activities for uh, teacher training that can work across different mediums. And then finally, we talk about this idea of mirror and model. So we really wanted the training to mirror the mindset and behaviors we want to see in children. So that is why, you, you know, if you see pictures of our program, you will see, uh, you know, teachers uh, getting their hands on, you know, um, aluminum foil to make uh, simple circuits, for example, or uh, programming in microbit or programming in scratch and so forth themselves in order to learn how, how to do it and to also just get buy-in on introducing all these um, uh, engaging tools to their students. So I want to talk a little bit about um, play labs and the idea of playful space. Um, so I should probably give a little bit of background about myself. I'm, uh, I'm an architect by training, and then I've worked in the field of playful learning for the last maybe 15 years through hardware and software um, uh, creative tools and games and toys and all sorts of things. And so I'm really interested in this intersection of like space and playful learning. So when, when we start thinking about the K-Play program and how it manifests itself within the schools, especially rural, uh, rural area schools in coastal Kenya, we were like, how can we you know, create a scalable model and also sustainable, I should add, of playful learning spaces in these rural, rural schools through participation? So we start working with the teachers during these teacher trainings and really engaging them on thinking about the space. We did uh, a few exercises. If we have time, we can, we can do some of them today together. We asked them you know, to uh, go to the level of a child and, and draw elements in their classroom from the eye level of a child. Uh, we asked them to make a collage of what they think their dream classroom would be and get feedback from, their uh, from the children and their students. Um, we really engage them to think of creative ways of, of their classroom as a space that facilitates creativity and, and playful learning and joy. And we also, oops, and we also looked at um, uh, local, local, uh, local uh, um, uh, tools and materials that we could include. So as we were doing that, we were thinking, okay, um, you know, we, not every school has a space that can be turned into a play lab. What can we do? And our uh, fantastic um, K-Play director in Kenya was, oh, what if we use one of these push carts? Um, uh, and instead of, you know, uh, having frozen yogurt in them, like the one I'm showing you uh, from the street in Mombasa, we actually put playful learning materials in them. So things like micro bits and, uh, you know, cir uh, circuit, uh, circuitry components. Um, craft materials and so forth. So we designed a push cart um, to, uh, to do that and go into the class. All this is launching in about 10 days. So that's why my pictures are mostly sketches. Uh, we also looked at, I, I asked earlier in the chat, what are some ways you could imagine creating your space, making your space more playful and uh, we created this poster. So I think somebody said, well, maybe words could be something that uh, could help. And it's true, like uh, simple words, these are words from uh, Lifelong Kindergarten's Creative Spiral um, uh, uh, framework. So even, you know, words in this space can really put us in the mindset of, of creativity and playful learning. Um, so these are some of the, of the um, uh, posters that we had in Greek, Greek uh, sorry, in English and Swahili. Uh, and we also developed uh, a, a small uh, play guide that um, uh, can come with a play lab and has uh, different challenges like the one you're uh, looking at with the micro bed. So what have we learned so far? I wanted to share some of the learnings uh, for others who are running similar programs, perhaps. And also I wanted to offer, uh, we have a report on our learnings at humanswhoplay.com slash lab if you want to download it uh, as a PDF there. So... <clears throat> I'd like to start in our learnings with a quote from Deborah um, Kimathi from the Dignitas Project in Kenya, um, who also was an early partner in this project. And she, you know, one of the things she says is there's only so much a teacher can do without the support of school leaders. 
And so this was really like a pillar in, in, in the programming we are designing. How do we involve the headmasters and the school leaders in this? Uh, really, in the end, as uh, you know, trainers of teachers uh, to really get full buy-in. If a teacher doesn't feel they have the support of their school, it's really hard for them to get motivated to implement uh, such a you know a, um, a groundbreaking program um, within 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 their school. Another thing we learned is that you know learning to step back is essential to understanding the value of play. Uh, many of you might be familiar with Angie Play in China. They have uh, developed a method that encourages teachers to step back and learn from their students and, and do a lot of observation. So uh, teachers really um, are elevated to the role of researchers and they discover the true value of play for children. This can be a really hard mindset to um, get into. So some of the ways we tried to encourage it in Kenya was we asked teachers to maybe record um, the children are play, and then we shared that video during the teacher training and 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 did this um, exercise of observing like what we learn, what are they learning while they're playing. So the other the other uh, thing we learned is that when you propose activities that have many solutions, you help shift a teacher's role. So a lot of the times we see a teacher, you know, uh, having this role of you know being the center of knowledge and uh, it's a really hard mind, mind, mindset to shift, especially if you're teaching, you know, a class of 80 students or 100 students at once. Uh, there are just practicalities in around that. But one way to kind of uh, encourage, you know, encourage a more student-centered approach to it is proposing activities that have multiple solutions. So when you have multiple solutions, um, it strips away the role of the teacher as the sole owner of knowledge. And this is a, a quote for from uh, J.C. Edelman from the Scratch Foundation. Um, the other thing we learned is that teachers can earn their students' respect even when they play together. So in the University of Johannesburg, uh, Dr. Lindford Maltake has been running Scratch Coding Club with his students on the Saturdays. And these club sessions are thought thoughtfully designed to match South African culture with moments to share, reflect, laugh, help each other, and more. The facilitators are no longer called teacher, but instead they're referred by students with their scratch name, a way to bring down the uh, hierarchy between the teacher and the students so that all can learn together and students can feel comfortable exploring and expressing themselves. Another thing we learned is around localization. So really involving the students and the teacher as part of that effort. Finally, teachers can really be motivated by social recognition from their communities. So as we're thinking you know, of the K-Play program, we're looking at ways that teachers get certified and celebrated and are truly you know, uh, champions of, of uh, innovation in, in their communities. So you, know, you can think um, about non-financial incentives for teachers like social recognition and public congratulations and finding the forum where teachers can get uh, recognized. And then finally, consider the program as an opportunity for exchange and not transmission of knowledge. I think um, uh, one, one of um, my favorite insights was talking to um, uh, the founder of Mundo Maker in Brazil, uh, whose mission is to bring kind of creative learning pedagogies to public schools and communities in remote areas in Brazil. And so <clears throat> he talked a lot about the, uh, the value of humility. And so when, you know, designing these programs, really kind of coming with a humble approach within the community and, and also looking to learn yourself, right? Um, so how, what do we learn as, as designers or program implementers um, within, within a program like this? So if you're interested to learn more about all this, or if you're interested about playful learning with technology and want to dive right in, uh, this is where you can find more. Uh, thank you so much. This is, this is my email, and uh, I'd love to get in touch. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chloe. Um, that was a wonderful presentation, and I think you've left us all feeling inspired going forward. So thank you so much for that. Um, next up, we have a few closing remarks at the stage. So please click leave session and you can return to the main stage to catch those final words. Um, thanks so much for joining us today, everyone. Okay, thank you. There are no questions, okay. Yeah, I will share my email and also like, does anybody have questions?
I see there are a few people around. Yeah, we definitely have the time for it. So if you have questions, you can add those to the chat yes. there. Uh, Hi, Lebowski. Funny, this says I have thought of co-design with ch with children. Yes, that's actually like a big way of how we developed follies. We work with children very closely. We brought them. Um, fun fun story about that. And initially, when we created this solution for the refugee camps, we just put a lot of materials in a big box and we called it play in a box and we brought the, the box to the kids and all the kids were doing were playing with a box and none of the materials inside. So we started thinking, okay, what is like something that we can create that is more durable than a cardboard that imitates kind of the same uh, feeling. And so uh, in, in a way it's amazing to co-design with children because they, they come up with these ideas and they know better than anybody else um, what they find engaging and fun. The group, the group of kids were, I would say, four to seven, four years old to seven years old. So um, uh, uh, preschool, kindergarten, uh, early uh, elementary. How did you decide on the ice cream cart over other ways of getting materials around? This was truly an idea um, by Carol, the program uh, director in Kenya. We, we were problem solving. We were thinking, okay, we have a very small, a small, you know, budget for for these play labs. And then we were also thinking of the realities of schools that don't have a dedicated space or the space is super run down. Or sometimes because there is no space, you need to have these sessions outdoors. Um, so, you know, th there is a ton of push cards around Mombasa and we were like, oh, what if, you know, what if we use that and the wheels are really big so, you know, they can go um, in unpaved uh, streets. Uh, so that's, that's how we came up with that idea. Yes, there's definitely a lot of design thinking uh, behind this and iteration as we go. Did you follow an established model for grade level, age level progression of structured play to align play atmospheres with curriculum expectations? For grade, um, do you mind elaborating a little bit? So I think a lot of, I think if I understand this correctly, you're asking if, um, if the activities we design are quite structured to match maybe with a formal school curriculum. If that is the question, I would say this is our next step. So one of the things we learned this year from working with teachers, I see as students get older, okay. Um, one of the things we learned with teachers this year was their need to actually have a little bit more structured play that matches um, specific lessons that they're teaching. So for a lot of them, they, they do this during an, an actual um, uh, a classroom session. So having more structured activities, that doesn't mean you, you take away their creativity. It's more just practically thinking, um, you know, how do you structure activities so uh, children are in groups or they have a very specific learning goal, perhaps that matches a, a specific lesson plan or CBC um, a standard. I think with uh, in regards to age, so like as students get older, more structured, but still play focused. Um, this is an interesting question. So one of the other projects um, our studio works on that I, I didn't mention is um, with the National Academy Foundation, which uh, works primarily with high schoolers. And it's all about um, uh, getting high schoolers uh, prepared for jobs and, and college. And so you would think, okay, high schoolers, like you can't really do playful learning things with them because, you know, they're almost adults and, they, you know, they don't think about, um, let's say, you know, more open-ended play. But we have found that, um, you know, uh, students of all ages really, um, really are more engaged when they have a playful learning experience. And the reason for that is, we, I, I think it stands for all humans, but, you know, when somebody tells you to learn something, uh, because you have to, you're much less likely to do it, whereas when the experience is presented as fun. And, and the great thing about play is that even when you're introduced maybe serious topics like getting a job that might be stressful or like an internship um, and so forth, um, it really kind of demystifies that and, and puts you in a mindset where, you know, you're more you're more relaxed, you're more open-minded, you start kind of um, getting into a more uh, engaged uh, kind of state of mind. Great, any other questions? I 
I see, Jim, you work with IREX on other human-centered on high school projects, and we call it tinkering. Yeah, there's many ways to call this. Um, I would say even with playful learning, I think one thing we learned is that uh, uh, people respond better to creative learning than playful learning. So sometimes it is play, but we call it creativity or tinkering or whatever makes sense for that community. And I think that's fantastic. Let's see if there are other questions. Thanks so much, Chloe. This is great. Great. Well, don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, I think my email is in the chat. Uh, and yeah, I'm always I'm always up to uh, learning more about what other people are working and, and helping as much as we can. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.